Hunter uh, is at Homebrew. It is a amazing VC. Seed stage investments, they spend- We're six, six and a half years in, so I, here's what I say. Post viable, pre-excellent. They have product market fit. We do, that is yeah, true. Yeah, great. Uh, before this, he was at Google for many years. Uh, uh, on the product management side on YouTube, yes, running a fact, very large team. In fact, uh, the two other mentors who are here, uh, Katie and uh, uh, Jess, we all, we all worked at Google together. For about 10 years, right? Uh, yeah, I was there uh, 2003. Uh, the way I say it is my, uh, my heart left middle of 2011, my body left end of 2012. <laughs> uh, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, show, you also, joke, you know, m just more background before we get into the, the amazing scripted questions. Uh, you also were on the founding team for Linden Labs, which was Second Life. Yeah, right? so uh, depending upon what you're into, uh, you might know about this. Uh, we were uh, a sort of a immersive virtual world. You sort of think about it as like uh, you have an avatar and you get to go in this world. It's kind of like Lego on steroids. And it turns out that it is very appealing to a small group of people. And so now this is a 19-year-old startup that is like profitable ongoing. people is a lot. It, uh, uh, be Benchmark invested in it in like 2004. I think it's sort of like probably they're still like their longest unexited uh, investment. Um, but uh, they did, they've dividended some, dividended did, did some money. So I think I turned like my $4,000 of uh, uh, early team equity into $16,000. Oh, so. That's a one bedroom uh, for about 90 days here in San Francisco. Well, you gotta make your money somehow. Yeah, the Google and stuff worked out better. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and so, and then before that, just to, to close out the background, you worked at Deloitte as a management consultant and you worked I'm on 40, Conan O'Brien show, I'm 45 right? and I went to a liberal arts college. And so if you didn't want to go into like teaching or something, you essentially went into banking or consulting. Uh, at least like that was my path. And I didn't, knew I didn't want to be a banker. So I went and been a consultant. The problem was like after the training class, I realized I didn't want to be a consultant. But I didn't have the gumption to sort of quit and like go do something that really spoke to me. So I kind of went through the, I found, I created some interesting projects for myself, did it for about two, two and a half years and then got back on my path. But that was like, Conan was, my mom's an artist, but they had business and so. Your, was that your first job, NBC on I, No, no, well it was kind of, I was, um, I spent my senior year of college, I compressed my thesis and my independent work down to like a uh, day, two days a week. And I spent uh, three days a week, essentially, you know, like a 40 hour work week, um, working on the second season of Conan O'Brien. So I look back on my career tree, and the o although I have no regrets about how it turned out, uh, the only decision I would have made differently is I would have stayed on Conan. Not because it was incredibly successful or anything, but because that was the one decision going into consulting, not staying on that, the one decision I made out of fear, as opposed to like doing what I loved and be, believing I could be good at it, I gripped too tight and I said, oh, I need to do something. Like fear and ego got in the way. I'm like, well, I'm smarter than these people. I need to go be a management consultant and uh, uh, you know, I need to make, you know, $27,000 a year instead of $12,000 a year. This is 1995. Uh, because like I, I don't have, you know, I'm not rich. I don't have any, like my parents aren't gonna give me anything. Um, and those were all true. Those were good reasons, like absolutely good reasons. But basically after that, I decided that I was gonna make career decisions with three things in mind. I was only gonna work on um, projects I wanted on my tombstone, right? So things that are personally relevant to me and that I uh, feel comfortable associating my identity with. You get all of Hunter, you don't get personal Hunter, professional Hunter, they're just Hunter. I was gonna work on things that I thought I could make um, a unique impact on. So if another 100 people could do the job maybe a little bit better, or a little bit worse, about the same, let one of them people do it. I wanna go do something where I'm uniquely needed and where um, I have uh, an ability to impact the curve. So do I believe that uh, the responsibility I'm taking on, if performed uh, to the best of my abilities and with the team, can we, with that, can we make a difference? Can I see over the two, three, four, five years I'm there, can I see a difference? Um, and obviously some of this, you know, sort of you convince yourself one way or the other and every, you know, especially at a large company as Google got larger and like not every day is, is, uh, is rainbows. But um, I really think, I, I mean, this sort of goes to the venture stuff because we were talking about this in the breakout, you know, like what do investors want to see? I'm like, well, Here's the biggest misconception about seed investing. The biggest misconception about seed investing is that like every company is good or bad and investors, like all investors will look at that company the same way and be like, that's a good company, I wanna invest in it. And then you either like win the deal or not. 
or like that's a bad company. I don't want to invest in it. The reality is that if you take 10 great investors and show them a bunch of wonderful companies, show them all the companies in this room, um, right off the bat, half of them are gonna be like, I don't get it. You know, like they pattern match. It's just, it's not gonna pattern match against their thing. They're like, really? I like founders that are tall and you're short. Or like, I like founders that, you know, I like businesses that have Z's in their name and you have in, in too many vowels. Like, I mean, things you cannot, like, I'm being ridiculous because it's things you cannot control, right? Like we're all humans. Then the other half, that's, that's your pool. Those are the people who, um, uh, uh, again, like not all of them are gonna say yes because those people, they understand what you're doing but they all have different risk tolerances. Some people are like, I like first time founders. Others say like, I can't deal with first time founders anymore. Some say, I don't mind uh, if you don't have a technical co-founder because I think I really know how to help you like build your eng team. Others will be like, sorry, I only fund technical founders, right? And so what you have to look for is amongst those investors, the ones who, like, your business has certain types of risks, the ones who would be comfortable with those risks. So I over-index on, uh, I'm willing to take uh, first-time founder risk, I'm willing to take market size risk, I actually like markets where the problem is larger than the market, like the de there's a lot of pent-up demand that's not yet expressed uh, in like one you know, single like, oh, 200 million dollars are spent per year on this, or you know, da, da, da. I'm like, I, I, I like when somebody has an insight that sort of doesn't yet get represented by spend. The flip side is I um, have very little tolerance for, I probably over-index on like founder market fit. So I care a lot about like, why are you doing this? Of all, why are you doing this together? Of all the things you could be working on, like why do you wanna work on this for 10 years? Um, and like that's, I don't know if that makes me, that doesn't in and of itself make me like an objectively good or bad, skilled or unskilled investor. It just leaves me hopefully with a mutual group of like mutual self-selecting founders that I know I can get up every day in the morning and be thrilled you know, to work with. So I think like any investor you're working with, you should sort of be cataloging in your head like what risks are they comfortable with and what risks aren't they comfortable with? Because for two things, one, like you're trying to assuage their risks, like this is sales, right? Like I'm a sales manager and a psychologist, right? Like when you're talking to investors, like you're in sales mode. So you wanna be able to sort of accurately address their concerns but then you also don't wanna have to be all things to all people. Like you wanna, in a best case scenario, find investors who are comfortable with the risks that you have in your company because those are gonna be the ones that you can be honest with, that you can lean into, that you don't have to manage, that aren't gonna freak out like the first time that that risk rears its head. And uh, I mean, look, at the end of the day, your job as a CEO is to keep money in the bank. And so, you know, get the money where you can, you know, so long as you're not taking it from people whose ethics and values you don't believe in. Um, there's lots of value in money from people that aren't gonna bother you and just go and do your thing. But I actually think that you should strive for a better class of investor, a group of people who don't wanna just hold you, hold equity in your company, but wanna support you as people. But but then talk to me about that too, because you said, you know, you, you chose to leave Google in what, 2012 you said, um, you don't wanna do something that you can't put all of Hunter into, and you don't wanna do something that 100 other people couldn't do. So, so one, why VC, and then, what is it unique that Hunter does or that yeah. Homebrew does in VC? Yeah, so I would not be in venture right now if it wasn't for Homebrew. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for a lot of people in the industry. Obviously, we collaborate with them both in the seed rounds we do and certainly later rounds. Um, but uh, I had only sort of thought of venture as like one of two models. Either you're at a billion dollar fund and I, you know, I was always asked to be like, do you wanna come join us to be the consumer internet partner or whatever? So I was like, oh, I can go to one of these billion dollar funds with like 13 people, sit around a table, be told that I like, there's one or two sectors that I'm covering and I'm either in the companies that matter or not in that sector and da da da. I'm like, people who are good at that are awesome at that. I don't wanna be good at that. Or I can be investing in, you know, dozens of companies and put, you know, small checks into all those companies and like let Darwin sort it out and then uh, tweet, you know, uh, the selection bias of how smart I am about the three that won. Again, people who do that, they do it really well. I'm fortunate enough to be a small LP in funds of both of those models, and I'm very glad that those people have my money. Um, but I went into venture because I was ready to move from the doing side to the helping side, and I specifically wanted to do it with my partner, Sacha. We had worked together 03 to 06, always talked about working together again. Um, and towards the end of 2012, uh, he left Twitter, I was thinking about leaving Google, we had the opportunity to answer that question. And so he said, we had always been happiest in our careers, years zero to five of companies. Lots of benefits come from being at years five through 10, 10 to 15, like the maturity of hypergrowth, but we had always had the most fun 
working with founders or at companies ourselves, we were just trying to figure out whether anybody wanted this. And then when it starts to click, dealing with that, how do you go from five people to 50 people to 500 people? Wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we could spend the rest of our career perpetually in that zone? And if you're gonna do that, you only do one of two things. You're either incubating stuff or you're giving money to other people to let them build what's in their head. That felt much more exciting to us um, because of this. Because there's so many people who, based on where they grew up, based on the generation they're part of, based upon the industry, based upon what their family did, based upon what they studied, as every business becomes a software business, you know, whether you think of it as software eats the world, I think of it as software enables the world, there is so much good being created by smart folks who want to apply software, want to apply technology to new industries, industries that predate the PC, that I just thought, man, how privileged would I be to spend you know, the next 20 years if I could help uh, those folks, some number of those folks, just move slightly faster, have slightly better information, you know, improve decision making and velocity of that decision making by a little bit. Um, the world is so much better off for those companies finding their scale, for those people who are building things that they want to put on their tombstone, building something that they're proud of. Um, there was no, you know, even in 2013, there was plenty of capital coming into seed stage investing and now even more so. And so we knew that just having a checkbook uh, wasn't enough to accomplish our mission and certainly wasn't enough to make us relevant to folks here, um, folks building companies. I mean, that would be the sort of height of arrogance or privilege to just sort of be like, well, you know, look at our resumes, now we have some money, let's write some checks. Um, what we felt like, a lot of the money that was coming into seed stage was being arranged in ways that had more to do with how uh, investors wanted to organize their business than what um, uh, uh, all founders wanted. Again, lots of people, you choose different ways to fund your company, they're not right, they're not wrong, they're just choices. But we saw that a lot of the money that was coming in was either these funds that were you know, multi-stage, right? So like, we'll invest C, we'll invest A, we'll invest B. Um, you know, we've got this one suit, we're gonna put your baby in that suit and that's gonna make the baby grow faster. Like, that's not how it works. Like, seed stage companies, young companies, you can't, you know, you can't put them in adult clothing, you can't force feed them to make them work. You have to understand them uniquely. Um, or there were these companies, or these funds that had started out as like one or two partners and for a variety of reasons, now we're like hundreds of million dollars and four or five, six, seven partners with large operations teams also like, great, 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 it's wonderful. We love working with those funds. But it wasn't the way that we wanted to practice. We felt like that you actually get a lot of value from somebody who's not just at board meetings, but somebody who weekly or every other week is getting the reps with you to understand the context for your business so that they can be proactively useful, not just reactively useful. We can all send you the same, you know, reactively useful. Oh, hey, we need help hiring a PM. You'll get the same 50 resumes from everybody. But like the difference between you say, hey, we need a product manager who really understands customer acquisition uh, funnels for uh, SMBs and who wants to work at a values-driven company. I was like, okay, uh, let me go pry somebody out of their job who's like overqualified for, you know, and tired of being a middle manager at, you know, into it and is ready to join you. Like you only get that for when you work with these companies on a daily basis. And um, no succession plan, no growth plan, right? So uh, we're not trying to like perform for anybody. We're not trying to prove to our investors who are endowments and foundations and so on and so forth that like we're good responsible handlers of you know a hundred million dollars so next time give us 500 million. Um, we don't want homebrew, I mean we can change our mind if we want, we're entrepreneurs just like everybody in this room, but we don't want homebrew to live on beyond us so we don't have to spend 50% of our time hiring the next set of partners or trying to sort of figure out um, you know how our internal operations should work as we scale from two partners to ten people and waste all that time. Um, and so we didn't see a lot of those types of firms being founded anymore because it's actually really hard to make a small number of seed stage investments and hope that you can actually be good at working with those companies, that enough of those companies work. Um, and it's also, um, you know, uh, the economics uh, of that business, that model, mean that you need to be able to afford to get paid last. I mean, obviously we collect fees so and so forth. You know, there's, we have a small team, we have a nice office a few blocks away, but like, you know, year one and year two, I made 5% of what I made at Google. Like now even with three funds, you know, I'm making like 30% of what I made. And I'm not looking for like, you know, uh, 
like I'm just like you, you know, I'm eating ramen. But what I'm saying is like it's a privilege to be able to afford a model that allows me to be aligned with the interests of um, the people I back and ultimately my strategy as opposed to being like, how quickly can I get a billion dollars under management so that I can cut myself a fat check each year to support my lifestyle, right? So a bunch of things converged. I was willing to trade in the, trade in the years of operating success to enable this, to practice it in a way that I said, I am so thrilled to get up each day and go to, go to work on behalf of these founders and that's all I care about. Um, so that's, it doesn't have to be, we don't have to be right for everybody. Well, if I'm if I'm a founder sitting out there right now, I might be asking myself like, "Shit, he's gonna go get his Uber, and I can't be in the Uber. So, how do I how do I find Hunter? Because there's even we've even been hearing today that there's uh, so many people in the Valley have become cynical about the money. Like the CEO's job is to have money in the bank. Who gives a crap where it comes from? Get the money. Your board's not gonna help you at all. You're in this your own on your all in your own. Here's a knife. Throw it on the ground. Whatever. Like. How do we find you, and what, what are the questions? If what you are they, can what get are they money, supposed to do with the knife? They kill someone you, else. They oh, get okay. the money. I had. I was sort of following along, and, and then, then I just lost knife you. Came in. There was I'm a like, knife. Um, whoa. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, too dark. Too fast. Um, okay. How do we I, I find can't you? comment. Yeah. It's like I can't comment on how everybody else runs their business. All I know is that I have benefited so much from people taking an interest in me ahead of, you know, me deserving their time and attention, and so. Homebrew, where does the name come from? It's not because I'm like a craft brewer or something. I'm, I'm, I, I do like my coffee. I don't really like my beer. But the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, in the early days of sort of the PC enthusiasts, mod your own PCs, build your own PCs, it's a group of people who met on Stanford's campus. It's where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak met. And as a statement around that for all the business success, for all the king of the world, you know, IPO, da 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 they're like, actually, this is an industry that started just because people like to tinker with shit. And they benefited from one another sharing information and for doing it for the love. And so, although we're obviously like, I'm competitive, like I, I, you know, part of companies succeeding means like creating incredible life-changing events for the teams and the founders who bet on it and like be, I hopefully we're investing in people who are gonna do amazing things with that money. Um, uh, uh, but like, I don't wanna do that if I'm also not, um, living and espousing the values that can get lost as an industry grows. So long-winded way of saying, like, I will respond to every email at least once. I mean, in the sense of like, you know, any email that people drop in my inbox, like, I will reply to that at least once. I won't reply 10 times. I may not have the chance to jump on a phone call. I may not be able to look through your deck and give you feedback, but like, I have an SLA for at least not ignoring you, you know, that first time. I can't do everything I want to ongoing, but like, hunter at homebrew.co, like, Kate, Sacha, myself, we all have our emails on our website and it's not you know, because we're trying to build a spam list. Uh, like, I, I think it's so important to, um, I don't know if it's, you know, it's not about the ROI on responding to any one person. It's about remembering that like, I stand on the shoulders of the people who did this before me and if I've been lucky enough to benefit from that, like, it's important for me to pay that forward as well. And by the way, hey, uh, I also invested in one software business that uh, uh, started with a cold email to me and it exited earlier this year and returned three quarters of our fund. So like, sometimes that's an advantage as well, you know, uh, actually caring about people. Uh, where, if, if, if Hunter can't invest in everybody in the room though, what are the questions that, if you were, if you were in someone's shoes out, out here, what questions are you going to ask VCs to figure out if they're going to be a Hunter, if they're going to actually help my company or if it's just a check? Especially if I can get through the order of operations. Yeah, of, I'm look, sometimes get money. just a check is fine. Like, I guess I'd say, you know, sort of, I guess, you know, what are the questions to figure out um, from the point at which you meet somebody to the point at which they want to make an investment in your company? That, like, what are you doing to try to sort of, you know, qualify them? Obviously, you should be, you know, reference checking folks, talk to folks who work with them. Um, I think you want, you know, I mentioned earlier people who understand not just your business, but like are comfortable with the risks and the way you want to build it. Um, I think from a pure process perspective, um, especially if you're talking to like somebody who might want to be a lead investor, somebody who you're sort of going to anchor around, like they should be narrowing their path to conviction. Um, it's always fine, to, you know, to sort of say, um, you know, uh, here's what I think, you know, here's what I believe an investor who uh, will back us or will get to yes. Here's what I think that they have to be comfortable with. I want to explain like 
this, this, and this, because I know my business really well. And then, you know, when they're done, they're like, oh, great, hey, I'll give, think about it, I'll give you some feedback. It's like, did I answer those questions for you? You know, is there more information only that I can give you? Um, or then when somebody's like, hey, I'd love to have another meeting, you're like, okay, great, you know, um, just so I can make good use of your time, like, what are you still trying to figure out? Like, what are the things that I should, you know, besides knowing my business cold, like, what are the things that we want to spend time on? And so, because I think if you can narrow a path to conviction, if you can get somebody to start to think about and answer the question for themselves as an investor, what do I need to believe or what do I need to understand about this business to get to myself to the point where I'm going to write a check? Everything else is smiles and handshakes. It's, you know, we're all, uh, uh, some of us are all very personable people, like, I guess, except that guy that pushed, uh, pushed, uh, was it Lowry at the game? Oh, yeah. yeah. That I wasn't so good. Bad VC, was bad VC week on Twitter. Um, but, um, but, uh, like, I'm just a big believer that these, uh, these are bi-directional relationships and it, uh, it doesn't mean um, anything more than like inviting somebody into your cap table is like a big deal. And yeah, like, you know, you need that to survive. And sometimes that can feel like, you know, asymmetrical power or information, so on and so forth. But like, I think it's fine to ask questions that help some, you understand whether like, especially as those check sizes go up or somebody, you know, is going to be very involved. So that's why I would just say, manage your, like, Understand the person, understand the un, un, understand their behavior, understand the risks they're comfortable with, and understand their process. And it's fine to push on all of those. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, do we, how much time do we have left? Uh oh. Eight minutes and two seconds. Yeah, we could do questions after that. Eight minutes, five minutes. Now can we have we, seven minutes and fifty seconds. Can we do questions after the eight minutes? Yeah, we can do like 10, 15 minutes of questions. Oh, perfect. All right, we're yeah. good. So. Um, Sw switching gears just a little bit, uh, back to when you were an operator and a founder at Linden. Not what, to be honest, not really a founder. Okay. There was a solo founder. You know what it is like? Y y it's kind. You know, we all write things on LinkedIn that sort of are like yeah. semi-true, right? So I was the first non-engineer. Like you can call it in this parlance, you could call it founding team. But there was one founder. It was the CEO. This guy Philip Rosedale, really interesting guy. Um, and so I took all the founder risk without the founder equity. <laughs> Well, that sucked. Uh -huh. um, I told you, I got $16,000 back on my $4,000. Where else can you do that? It's America. Nowhere. Um, talk us through that process. That, that company did scale quite a bit. What did you learn oh, in the process? Up, down, right? So yeah. my years, OK, here's the one thing that I wish. I wish I was there a little bit over three years. I wish I enjoyed the third year more. I was 27. I was incredibly tense about like, oh, shit. If this doesn't work, like, are people going to think I'm smart? Like, what happens if not everything is perfect? Uh, uh, and I was also part of the, you know, I was, like, in that age where, like, ego and testosterone also turns into, like, and complacency. Complacency is, you know, is death, and, 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 and happiness is complacency. So never be happy. Like, uh, just, you know, it could always have been better. Like, don't give me a compliment. Just tell me how I could do better. And year three, when it was tough, right, like, I, I mean, like my parents would come visit me in the office and I had like a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of Mylanta. Like that's not sustainable. And I'm also, look, I'm also a believer like, uh, you know, so my general thing about startups is anyone who tells you that you don't have to sacrifice anything to do a startup is lying. And anything who tells you you have to sacrifice everything to do a startup doesn't have your best, you know, is also lying, right? Doesn't have your best interest at heart. So like you have to sacrifice something. You have to prioritize stuff in a big way. We are in an industry of, you know, sustainability can often be sprints and rest, not you know the marathon pace. Um, so it's nothing about like I worked too hard. It's I didn't stop and appreciate how lucky I was to be working on something I cared about with a really smart group of people. And I also didn't realize at that point in my career that the valley, uh, you know, whether we want to use that as a geography or the technology industry in general, really re um, rewards you for uh, working on hard problems with smart people. I didn't realize that like. Whether this was the next whatever at various times, it was like, this is the next version of the internet. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, like, uh, uh, until it wasn't. Um, you know, I didn't realize that there was enough people who, like, were, you know, technologists or future founders who were like, oh, man, I remember that. That was so cool. You guys were trying something really hard. That was really great. Like, um, and uh, in the moment, you know, that made that third year really not fun. Um, and so, like, you know, physically harmful. And so, you know, it's, you might think as an investor where, you know, like I said, I'm long-term greedy, like 
I want exits and I want them as big as possible. You might think that like my ex you know, explicit, implicit like mind fuck is always gonna be like, that's great, Manuel, but keep pushing. Like you're killing it, but go, you know, like you wanna build something bigger, keep going, like keep going, stay late, you know, like um, but what I actually like want is I want you to build something that fulfills its full potential. If I've done my job, I've picked things where that full potential is you know, incredibly valuable and people who have the attitude and aptitude to want to get there. But I also want to remind you every once in a while to like, like even the curves that look like this, the companies where you, know, you think it was this, like you zoom in and it's like this, 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 this. And the only way you get through that is like you know, your own confidence that you're working on something that matters with a group of people you care about. And so the big thing that I sort of take away, you know, and sort of is evergreen for me is like, be appreciative of, of you know, the journey we're on, not just the, not just the destination. And so like that, I think you feel, you feel it uniquely potentially as a founder and uniquely as a CEO, but I think you feel that regardless of whether you're the most senior or junior person on a startup team, um, you know, uh, whether, you know, and whether you joined on day one or day hundred or whatever. Um, and so I try to I try to continue to remember to to do that. Okay, that's really interesting. So well, I don't I think that, did that even answer your question. I don't remember what your question was. I don't remember. Yeah. So it was like you, you called me a founder. I said I wasn't really a founder. But what did I take from that? And that's what I took. I took like that, that you work on advice. things. You work on things that matter. Um, and you separate. You know, like in, in people's lives, you have good decision. You have good bad decision. Good bad outcome. The most important thing is to build your framework for making good bad decisions because in this type of industry it's hard to do what we're all doing. So you'll make good decisions that have bad outcomes, but if you don't realize that it was still a good decision, you might screw up that decision making and then next time you'll start lower, you'll, st you'll lower the ceiling, lower the ceiling, lower the ceiling on how you should be thinking about the world. And like the wonderful thing about power laws is that like if you keep making good decisions, when you have a good outcome, like one of those good outcomes is gonna be career changing, and I don't just mean economically. I mean, you're gonna work with 10, 15 people who turn out to be your tribe, and like for the next 15, 20 years, those are gonna be the people coming in and out of your orbit, or you'll have an exit, uh, you know, whether it's a small this, or you know, you're a founder, you're not a founder, whatever, that like, you know, all of a sudden is like a down payment, or allows you to pay, you know, get from like negative net worth to zero net worth. I remember like that was my happiest day, like, oh, I paid off my loans, like I'm now, I'm now broke instead of in debt. Like, that's amazing, you know? And then just, you know, levels of security that beyond that like there's things that you know and those all come from not you know obviously it's the outcome but they start with you know being true to your decision making at some point like you know uh, things work out if you if you make enough good decisions that it's good advice so I think I only have time for one more question I'm, ask, I'm gonna ask a kind of selfish one because it's one I care about it's what we were talking about back there too so you wrote this Medium post recently about, Ezra Klein was talking about the rise to your level of misery. Yeah. And I think it's, so the, I think the basic idea, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that in this society we all take the next job, the next promotion, um, and as you move up your role changes, right? All of a sudden you're managing a bunch of people. Um, every sales rep I've ever met wants to become a CRO and they don't realize that that job is looking at Excel and planning a couple years in the future and having tough comp questions with people rather than all the things that they liked about their other job. Um, what, what did you mean by that? Yeah, and then how can you me. apply that to, to their role? Because as these companies start to scale, it's not gonna be the same as it was when it was five people in the in the crummy we were. So yeah. yeah. Okay, so for me, it happened basically there's the, uh, you know, I loved as a product manager being on a whiteboard with a designer and two engineers and, you know, eventually competency put me, you know, in a room that was all about resource planning and haggling with other, you know, like VPs and blah, 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 blah. And I realized that um, I couldn't reconcile the fact that, you know, I loved uh, the work, but I didn't love the work it, take, it took to get the work done. But I still had too much of, you know, uh, uh, an ego or a control orientation. I didn't want decisions made above me. So like, who steps who steps out of the the role? You know that like, you know, is you know where you've been reaching. Like, um, not very many people are that self aware. I certainly wasn't that self aware in the moment. Um, and so I think it sort of is sort of kind of like it comes down to for me like generally like staying true and um, you know working on the things that make me happiest. I think in startups and the way it translates to startups in general. I see so many startups give up one of their key advantages 
so prematurely, and that's the flexibility of the org chart. So um, every org chart in every large company is wrong. I mean, it's fundamentally, you know, 99.9% .9 likely to be wrong because it was, it's an org chart that was created at a moment in time based upon an understanding of what the goals were there, the people you had in those roles, and a whole bunch of intangibles <laughs> about like who should report to who and what title is this and who like, who's shiny at the moment and who's not shiny. And like reorgs happen when the pain of a wrong org chart becomes greater than the pain of a reorg, right? Which, you know, depending on the company, can be anywhere from like, you know, every six to 12 months to every few years, right? Startups should be essentially like, uh, you know, uh, self-assembling, reassembling, and changing organisms that continually uh, uh, shape themselves to address the problem and opportunity at hand. Um, and they fall sometimes so quickly into the, this is the head of that, or this person who, because they've been around for a long time, is now running a team that they, you know, uh, may not be sufficiently ready to scale or the company's not giving them the help they need to succeed with outside mentorship or stuff like that. Um, or somebody, because they were a founder, you know, uh, uh, can't be an individual contributor because they own too much of the company, so they have to be a this. But they, they don't, they're not that, so we have to get rid of them, you know, like, as opposed to just having honest conversations about, like, what does this organization look like now and what would it look like, what does it need to look like a year from now? And if that's what it needs to look, we think it looks, needs to look like a year from now, like, why don't we do that now? Or um, if we're gonna be an organization that bets on the people inside and their ability to scale, what do we need to put into place to help strong individual contributors you know, become managers? How do, we, how do we take a few points of equity and throw it to advisors in those functional areas since we're, not, since we're still a few years off from having like a world-class CMO, a world-class CRO, so on and so forth. So how does our head of marketing who was this person who joined us 18 months ago and is awesome and is a, is a, is a, is a you know, cultural holder and excellent in her role, how do we make sure she succeeds you know, when we give her more responsibility? Um, and so I sort of have this conversation with uh, you know, almost all of the companies that I work with of like, you know, mark my words, there's gonna be a time at which you, know, you need to rethink how you're structured and you're gonna let a whole bunch of things that aren't sort of, you know, like first principles get in the way around, well, you know, that person will leave if we do this or this person. And like, you just end up sort of calcifying what is, you know, at its heart, like a seven person company that still doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> a, a 21 person company that now has some money in the bank, but essentially has to rethink, well, what did we do that got us here that we need to hold on to? But what things did we do that got us here that aren't gonna, you know, aren't right for the next two years. Um, and man, like, you know, people love to refactor code, people love to, you know, A-B test, you know, acquisition channels. People hate to have tough conversations about, you know, culture and fit and org and stuff. But like, that's what, you know, matters. And I was at a board meeting yesterday and I was doing a lunch and learn with the, the team before and they were saying, they were asking me, like what are some of the hallmarks of companies that succeed at scale versus those who don't? And I think they were gonna uh, uh, want me to, or expecting me to say things about like, well, did you pick the right market or how smart are the teams? Like how many Ivy League hires do you have or whatever kind of bullshit? And I said, I think uh, the teams that I've seen that succeed um, uh, are able to uh, have open discussions about what's working and not working. And you know, the ones that the ones that have those discussions are putting themselves in a position to like constantly get better and constantly solve that and keep everybody motivated and everybody knows that even through the hard times that they have a chance to make a difference there. The companies that don't, you know, it's because the truth was never spoken, you know, and uh, so people find it easier to leave than than change something or uh, everybody just kind of goes through the motions and you can't go through the motions at a startup. Great. Doesn't work. Okay. Questions. Questions. This mic. Was that self-interest? What do you? What, what, I feel like we got to lean you back on the couch a little bit. What's the? Uh, what? Wh oh. You said that was a self-interest. How do oh, we? Oh, was a. How do we help I you? I read Steven? the article. Oh, okay. I think I'm going to be okay. Okay, you're going to be. Okay? I'm doing fine. Yeah. You want to talk? You want to talk about Atrium? Uh, can people? Can people tell the truth? People can tell the truth. Yeah, Justin's yeah, like a. I think so. He's like a woke guy now. He can tell the truth. 
He's on Twitter. Yeah. Woken. Yeah. Super he wrote, no, he wrote, he's like, he's, I'm serious. Like, he, uh, no, he's really. He wrote the happiness stuff. Like, I think it's great. Like, I, it's a, I go to therapy. I do all these things. Like, it's I think made it's, a meaningful impact in our business over yeah, the last people, three like, to six months. The, the greatest, Would you agree? cha- greatest yeah. change we have is like, you know, de, de, de myth of, removing the myth of like the perfect person and um, that you can't bring your whole self to work and all that type of stuff. Like, the, the, the stuff we all do is too hard to, like, those are like, you know, okay, go run a marathon. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to put ankle weights on. Those that you can't talk about, you know, self-doubt or, you know, what makes you happy and what doesn't. So I think it's great. Yeah. And you consciously have to change that in a business. Yeah. Questions? This one? This mic? Kim? Question. Uh, a little maybe off topic. Uh, not so much about cryptocurrency, but what are your thoughts on blockchain? Uh, so we've taken the approach that... Uh, um, important enabling technology that maybe uh, we will have investments that are um, uh, dependent upon creating infrastructure uh, in this phase. And then we'll also have investments that will use the blockchain just like people use databases or use web hosting. Like essentially they're using it as a service that somebody else is providing. But, um, it, as with any area of emerging technology, I think it's hard as an investor to be partially committed and so we sort of made the decision a year and a half ago that like, hey, uh, we make six to eight concentrated investments a year. How am I going to pick like, if unless I'm going to go deep in this stuff, I'm not going to pick like one or two companies that I'm going to make an investment in. Like, that's ridiculous. I like this stuff's moving too quickly. So instead, we took a little bit of a different approach this time. We took a, like a single check. We took like a million, two million dollars that we normally put into a company. And we're like, let's put this. Let's put like two hundred fifty thousand dollars into like five companies that are all doing things that we think are at the infrastructure level. We think they're people who actually want to build companies and technology, just not like build, like they're not looking for quick liquidity. They're like building companies that just happen to be companies, um, you know, in this broader space. And uh, where there's like a combination of commitment, but also a little bit of like uh, nose for opportunity, right? Because I think part of the benefit, you know, if my investors sometimes tell me what they're doing is outsourcing their judgment to me, that's assen- like in giving me their capital to invest, that's essentially what I'm doing to entrepreneurs. And so it's an area where I think the people who are closest to it are gonna know when to sort of stick to their vision versus understand that there's really something else that needs to be built. And so we've done that. Like we, uh, we happen to have an earlier investment in sort of a, a chain from a, like a, a blockchain API, you know, that, that exit and stuff. But otherwise, we sort of think of it as an area where we've, you know, we've told our uh, investors like, the fund we're currently investing out of will be like 32 companies. And I'll be like, I bet a few of them are, you know, crypto sp- specific. And I bet a few of them are, are going to be uh, possible only because of infrastructure that's being built. And then there's going to be a lot that like have nothing to do with it. Yeah. Because I think if like anything, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. You sort of look and like phases go between where there's like generalists, like I, I sort of think there's like innovation and business model and innovation and technology. Innovation and business model, innovation and technology. You know, five years ago, six years ago, we were seeing a lot of innovation and business model, for better or for worse, which is why, like in certain areas where you guys saw like, oh, marketplaces for everything, Uber for everything, like and obviously, you know, Airbnb for everything. And obviously, like a lot of those didn't work. Some sort of evolved and, you know, interesting stuff. And now I think we're, you know, uh, you know, maybe the business model version now is like, you know, D2C for everything, like D2C jeans, D2C detergent, you know, D2C mattresses. But you also have these waves of technical innovation around, you know, crypto, around computational biology and health sciences, um, you know, a few others where I think you really have to be, like, you have to be vertically deep in that um, if you're going to take a concentrated approach. If you're going to put a bunch of small checks, great, like, go find a bunch of smart computer vision folks and invest in, like, whatever they're doing. They'll probably figure something out. Um, so that's the way that we've sort of approached it, like uh, um, stay ankle deep um, uh, and, and know it. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, opportunistic. It's our, it's our fun. We get to do whatever we want, right? Yeah. Hey, Hunter. Uh, Kyle Flanagan, Prime Light Works. Oh, there you go. Hey. Hey. Uh, thanks for coming. Nice so beard. Nice beard. I pre- you, yeah. you as well. Exactly. <laughs> right on. Hey. So for a breakthrough hardware technology yes. that hasn't yet been validated in the market, can you speak about the roadmap for the diligence process? Um, Does it know? take packets, small frozen packets, and turn it into juice? Because <laughs> I would pivot. That's a little bit 
It's a little bit harder than that. Too close to heart. But just patent pending, uh, yep. prototype test data, technical diligence with you know mentors, industry experts, and then you know customer feedback. Like yeah. How does that roadmap process look like at Homebrew? Tens. So for that type of stuff, it's interesting. When we've invested in that, um, especially unless it's an area where there's like. Um, snowballing investor interest, right? Like we were in the seed round of Cruise from like, you know, Tom's Cars, because at the time people were like, oh, this might be something that like Google does, but no startups ever gonna do this. And they took approach of aftermarket whatever, and you know, like 18 months to a very large exit. Um, but for things that are a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, if not contrarian, let's just call like not yet well understood, we've actually tended to co-invest alongside um, like specialized hardware funds and or um, strategics, like industry, you know, high net worth individuals or strategics who we feel like um, can de-risk a little bit of the, um, the go to market. Uh, and like, if they, do, if they can do what they say they're gonna do, like, how does this, how does this get into the industry? And so um, we, uh, I mean, there's things that we're team, team market investors always. So there's nothing different about like, do we believe in this team? Like, do we wanna get up every morning and put sweat and reputation behind them? Um, in the market, the, usually the two things that we have to figure out for those types of businesses are one, um, are they properly assessing the degree, of the degree of technical difficulty? It's not even so much like, and is it easy or hard? It's like, do they really understand, you know, the, the known unknowns you know, versus the unknown unknowns. And the second is, if they're right, is it worth it? So like for example, if there's both like deep hard tech risk and go to market risk, boy, like then you really need something special in order for it to work. If it's essentially like, this is hard and I think they, I don't believe they can build it, but if they can, like they're gonna be a one of one company, <laughs> um, then that's like always worth our risk. Because we much rather back people like that, and you know, bless you, and risk, you know, sort of like, hey, if it doesn't work, like, there's no, you know, medium exit here, like, it just doesn't work, you know, like they can, like, it didn't happen. Like, I much rather do that and take a zero, knowing that if it does work, there's something special. Um, so the more, and so sometimes what founders in that space can do is if they're already bringing along the strategic or the industry experts, and they're like offering those people up to us even you know, as like, hey, this is par part of your diligence process. We're gonna help you get smart about this space. Here's the stuff to read. Here's the people to talk to. Um, and also to articulate, as funny as it sounds, why am I seeing this deal, right? So um, if you can say, I mean, what's the answer to that? It's usually something like, I've got a bunch of industry experts. I also want a generalist. Like, I also want somebody who helps me just navigate the building of a company and the fundraising and this type of stuff. And so I'm pairing these, like, you don't have to know this tech better than I do. I know this and we have people here to validate and support us. What I need alongside of that is a generalist who I think is gonna be my partner in helping think through how do I build this company. And I was like, ooh, then you know, it's like, it's like the Pavlovian response. I'm like, oh, you want me, as opposed to just like, 100 people who are smarter about this than me said no, and I'm now lucky enough to see it, yay. Yeah, I got, just gotta leave it at 615. Okay. So I can, can change I it to a suit in a parking garage. <laughs> that you it's please like, repeat the question for the people all the way in the back. Oh, sure, Thank sure, you. sure. All you. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, just one short question regarding the measure and risk, upside and downside. How do you measure risk for vertical AI startups if you're dealing with any? Yeah. Uh, how do you measure risk for vertical AI startups? I like vertical AI much more so than horizontal, actually. Um, and so, uh, uh, I I get most excited when, uh, if successful in that vertical, it increases revenue, not decreases costs. So I think if you have, if you're building something that in the, you know, sort of essentially the uh, increase, you know, whatever you're doing to the workflow, whatever you're doing in the, you know, the thing that used to be done manually and ineffectively in, in and whatever, and now the computer is, you know, making everybody smarter. If that ends up driving top line, I know you're gonna be able to capture a meaningful part of that. If it is more about um, efficiency on the cost side. Um, it's like we, we still do stuff like that all the time. It just then has to be like a little bit, then I really need to know like the go to market, the pricing is the, the person who's gonna buy that has a budget. So like what's an example? Let's talk about like I've seen like uh, 
uh, vertical AI and like uh, call center routing or stuff like that, like pretty basic thing. Um, like cost savings. Uh, the people managing call centers are currently incentivized in very different ways uh, than necessarily, and don't have necessarily the software budget to spend on that. So you need organizations where like there's somebody above them who's going to sort of change the KPIs or, their, or it's an organization that's coming to sort of a breaking point in the way that they like have handled their, their CX or that like the economics of getting it right or wrong are so significant that, you know, basis points improvement in whatever efficiency um, like uh, leads to like, you know, leads to retention of high lifetime value customers, da 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 da, versus just like, you know, saving a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a of a of a second, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's how I sort of think about it. Um, I, I don't think about market size, I think about problem size. Is the problem you're trying to solve large, urgent, and valuable? If it's if you have two of the three, you have a business, you if you have all three of three, you have a venture business. So sometimes there'll be things where it's like it can't be represented by current spend because it's like people doing it and like so you're like, well, okay, you know, how do I figure out how to articulate um, the value here? But I, I generally think there's a lot of good businesses to be built in vertical AI. So long as it's, you know, I always say like AI, most people's pitches of AI is machine learning and most people's pitches of machine learning is like, you know, co-visitation and most people's like, <laughs> um, so it really depends like also like what's that, like what's the black box? Like, you know, how do you train the model once, you know, um, you know, Good stuff, though. Well, we got like one Is more question. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. And then I'm seriously, I'm not talking to anybody. Yeah, and then like, he's gonna run, and you have to stay. Yeah, like I know, I always know what happens. Somebody's like, I just want to walk with you, or this or that. I, you're so special. I know you're special. I love you. There's nothing to do. But if I say yes to one person, then I, I gotta go. I gotta go. Hey, Andre, thanks yeah. for coming. Yeah. Um, it seems like many of the best investors only invest in software-related companies. Um, and you mentioned in a question earlier that you will invest alongside hardware tech uh, investors or um, industry uh, players. Like, for example, for an energy product, you'd invest alongside, I guess, a utility, mm -hmm. VC fund. Yep. Um, is it worth pursuing? Say there's alignment on personality and values with a great investor who really only seems to invest in software. Is there any value in pursuing them? Um, I think I think there's always value in putting a little bit of energy on top of the funnel, but it's sort of this question about like, if I help you understand, you know, if I help you understand this business, do you think you'd be in a position to make an investment or is it we just too far afield for you? I think that's always a fair question to ask. But there's people who are interested in area, like essentially everybody's thesis is like, represents 80, everybody's thesis focus and expertise represents 80% of their investments and the other 20% are random, right? Like it's, I trust this, I don't know, know nothing about this, but I trust this person. Or like, uh, I would just, this is like, I, I'm, you know, at my, I studied biology in undergrad and, and this just like, this was what I wanted to do my thesis on. And like, I've made a lot of money on these other deals. So I feel okay taking a lark here. Like a bunch of things that can't be explained. And it turns out if you're right, you get called like bold and innovative. And if you're wrong, you didn't have discipline, you know, right? But, um, you know, I think the best investors are willing to sort of take those risks on the, on the stuff they don't know. So it comes down to that. And, you know, it's, uh, um, but I wouldn't disproportionately invest time in people whose interest in learning or whose curiosity um, doesn't uh, eventually turn into, like I was talking earlier, that sequence of like, how do you get to yes? What are you trying to learn? Because especially on areas that are starting to get trendy, I've seen so many uh, friends, especially at the Series A, where you have these funds that are just like built to take meetings and, and, and soak up knowledge. like they just sometimes aren't prepared to make an investment yet, no matter how persuasive you are. They're like, we just don't have, you know, we're not going to do robotics yet. Okay, well, I'm not going to send my robotics companies to you just to inform you. All right, hunter at homebrew.co. I swear I will return emails. Thank you. At least once, just once. <laughs>